microphones when the discussion's going, although we're happy to facilitate the movement of microphones if possible. Um, that's great. So my name's uh, Andy Harper. I'm, for your sins, you actually get me in back-to-back -back panels. And I hope during this chat with Andy, we'll take the show and then the audience with their questioning and responses um, will free me up to be still welcome at the panel after this on the inclusivity discussion. But I have to declare a personal interest in what's coming up now. Um, I'm going to be modestly say that the reason Professor Andy Markovitz's 50 years of tenured scholarship as a professor is even in the country um, goes back to the graciousness of his spirit. So you've heard him on the panels, you've heard some of his promptings from the audience. I just want to give you, before we start, a little window into the person that is Professor Andy Markovitz from my limited experience, limited but very rich experience. Um, when I was doing my PhD at Sydney University, uh, as is the way of things when you have to, on an annual basis, justify your position to the university um, and my period of justification was approaching, I needed to be able to say that I'd been presenting my work around the place. Um, and so I needed to find a conference to go to. And having read a lot of Andy's stuff as I was doing my research, I thought I'm going to try and find a, a, a conference, Northern Hemisphere Summer Conference, where Professor Markovitz might have been presenting and I'll happily go and sit and listen to him. Um, and so on speculation, I accessed the University of Michigan uh, website and his email and completely, completely without any forewarning or any other introduction, sent this query to this Professor Markovitz asking if he was going to be presenting at any conferences that summer of 2016. Um, and the response from Andy to this person from the other side of the world, indeed from the arse end of the world, as many of you have realised now that you've had to travel here, was I'm not going to be presenting at any conferences, um, but please feel free to come to Ann Arbor and we can talk. Now, I actually took him up on that invitation um, and I visited Ann Arbor and he gave me his time. He gave me access to his students. He invited me into his man cave uh, in his beautiful home in Ann Arbor where we watched the first game of the football season, Michigan away to um, Notre Dame or Notre Dame or whatever you say in the American vernacular um, at South Bend, Indiana. And we sat there in his sports room, which doubles up as the television room. And he invited me to the big house where with 109,000 other people, we watched uh, Michigan play Southern Methodist University. And the reason why I'm telling this story is because of the serendipity of life, how beautiful that serendipity can be um, and how amazing it is to have this guy with an unbelievable life and professional experience to share with us. And it's because of his graciousness. So if he says something that provokes, uh, that's good. But I can assure you it comes from a position of immense depth of consideration and life experience, um, sprinkled with heavy, heavy doses of wonderful humanity and graciousness. That's how I know him. That's why he's here. Uh, it's a complete privilege to have him. I've since been back to Ann Arbor at his invitation as well and had the same sort of stuff bestowed upon me as a personal thing. So that's the gushing part of the introduction out of the way. Um, welcome, Professor Andy Markovitz. Let me gush right back, but I already did that. Um, they, they've got to hear this, this is the good thing. Yeah, this, okay. Uh, uh, I'm, I have supervised, I don't know, 50 doctoral theses and all over the world, and, uh, but Andy is one of the, he's really a, one of a kind, he's a unicorn. Uh, and he wrote a brilliant dissertation uh, completely out of his, for his own intellectual interest. Not for academic purpose, not for this, not for that. You know, and an and adult and, and, and wrote this amazing dissertation and which I was, which I advised, uh, co-advised obviously, because he needs someone who was sitting here. And, and I'm just so, so proud of him. I, I'm, I'm, 
I'm proud of all my students that I'm, I'm going to retire in the year, and the only ones that I miss are my students, not so much my colleagues, uh, <laughs> undergraduates and graduate students. Uh, but Andy is a unique person, you know, a unique person, and uh, um, our discussions about sports and sports taking off into politics and all kinds of other aspects is it's just really, uh, uh, really uh, priceless. So even the, the horrible 14 hour flight from Los Angeles, is, you know, I really said I came for Andy and the other brilliant doctoral student of mine, David Smith, who's now a big shot professor at this university, American Studies and Political Science. And somehow I was already, we just started the, the, the term now, so he could not come to this conference just to join this meeting. So I have two wonderful doctoral students in this town. Before I go further, I want to correct something that I, I, I said before at, on this panel, and Nico kindly corrected me that apparently Chancellor Olaf Scholz did visit the German women's national team in its final against England in Wembley a year ago. And I beg forgiveness, I did not know this. I, but it shows you in, in some ways how less of a radar this game was for me than it is for the mantra. Anyway. Well, there's there's ground to be gained in fake news. And as we know, so you got the attention you so craved. And have entered the place like a whirling dervish, I'm sure. And and the thoughts that you provoke are manifest and they're varied. Um, some of them are included in this book. Uh, which is the, the, going to be the topic of our conversation. And it's the start, starting question. Um, uh, women in American soccer and European football. I mean, the first question to the uninitiated is why do you need to delineate in the headline, in the in the title of the book? Are they two different planets, two different sports? Or what, what, what's what's the reason? For two different uh, two different names. And as we know from the book by Stefan Shimansky and uh, and uh, no, 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 not so. Um, uh, it's uh, it'll come to me. Uh, they did this wonderful book about the, the 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 nomenclature of in the English language of soccer and it's horrible what it stands for today. In other words, how this word has become, which was used almost interchangeably with football. Not quite, but I, even if you go to the hollow ground of Old Trafford, to which I try to go once a year, pilgrimage, and when you look at the, the shrine or the little shrine for the um, terrible thing that happened in Munich on February 6, 1958, at 3.04 uh, BMG, Greenwich Mean Time, it actually uses the word soccer in the, in the, the homage. And in the course of the last 30 or so years, it has become the most hated word in England. It's a form, it's a shimp word. It's, you cannot use it. And I found this, I find this fascinating. Actually, by the way, with Andy, we talk about that all the time, about the importance or the difference of uh, of, of, of the English accent in the game. And he points out to me that even here, yesterday's game between the United States and uh, help me against Portugal, the commentators, two English people. So in other words, the 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 the, the failures or the, the authenticity of the sport is still defined by an English accent and nowhere more than in the United States or it's, it's an ambivalent uh, and very good. And in England, of course, the word soccer is completely. And I have a, 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 a thing in there in this book, also in another one, where some of the American, I mean, all American players and all American players and coaches are a priori delegitimated by dint of their American accents, which does not exist in any other language. I mean, they're not the, 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 the you know, they're not disqualified in German because they don't pronounce the spot. It doesn't matter. But in, 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 in the English speaking world, the name, what do you call this sport, is already an indication of 
what you are, where you stand, and so on and so forth. So that's why it was American soccer. And interestingly, of course, the word soccer is 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 precisely more popular in in countries in which associ the association game was not dominant. Canada, soccer moves, Australia, uh, obviously the United States, and versus the word of football and in, in England, where again soccer has become completely out of the question. So that's why I by the way, and these copies now that I already gave one to Sarah, these five copies of course are free. So avail yourself of it. I'm not taking them back to the US. I'm gonna show you. Well, we have we already have one taken for one of those. So John Carney, you're sorted. Okay. That's the Scotsman in the room. Oh, what's that? Yeah. Richard wanted to pay for one. Right. <laughs> that's the English of the room. <laughs> so, so the word, that, that's why it's America, yeah, that's why um, American soccer versus uh, European football. Okay, so that leads, you raised the point. Um, we're going to get into some diversity after this, some diversity discussion, very important diversity discussion. But in the current discussion around diversity in, in football, the focus of this conference in a sporting sense, how important is this discussion when we're trying to unlock some of the mysteries of resourcing um, for women's football, but also in the former colonies, the white dominions of the British colony, British Empire? Your point about lack of diversity in the commentary box. Now, how, how in changing culture, which is a central issue for pretty much everything we're discussing over these two, three days, how can you change culture when the commentary feed that goes right around the world to English speakers, can the presumption be that after 130 years of exporting soccer and playing soccer in the former white dominions of the British Empire, can there not be a single American, New Zealand, South African, or Canadian, if there's a difference, there is for you, not so much for us, accent in the commentary box. Rather, every game that is being beat right around the world to a global audience has an English accent. Nothing else is acceptable, apparently. How can we overcome that? And still at the same time, do we need to overcome the similar issues in the former colonies, which is our particular interest in Australia, to unlock the mystery of resourcing? Well, um, it, look, uh, in these British externalities in which soccer clearly still is striving to become a hegemonic sport in the Mark of its cultures, uh, uh, hegemonic culture in my the way I use it in my work, a uh, soccer still has to strive, which means it still has to gain a form of authenticity. It still has to get street cred. And street cred is lent by excellence on the field and also history. And the history is in fact English or British, or actually really English. And that is a form that cannot be so. So in the United States, there's this constant debate about, you know, it happens all the time when my book Offside came out in 2001. I was on tour all the time. And I would, it, would, it would happen to me repeatedly. You know, Professor Markovitz, brilliant lecture, but why do you dare call this game soccer? It's football. You know, some guy in Ohio, I said, look, I'm not going to get into this nonsense nomenclature war. In the United States, football means something different. It doesn't mean it's less, and it's a, it's a, it's a form, it's a, what the Germans call Glaubensbekenntnis. In other words, it's a clearly, it's a, it's a form of religious credence. It's a kind of, you know, this is, if you want to be authentic, you have to code this in English terms. And I think that, you know, this, it just is. I mean, you can't fight it. I think you can only fight it ultimately by really attaining, creating your own world uh, and a successful one. And if indeed, and we're getting into this for the conference, I think clearly the United States has been immensely successful in the women's game. But uh, at the risk of being um, uh, criticized here, women's, the women's game is not strong yet, strong enough <laughs> to create hegemonic culture meaning that it becomes a quotidian discussion all the time, you know, for 365 days a week. Mm -hmm. And for that, it has to be the men. 
And I hope that in my lifetime, although I fear that it won't happen, uh, the, the men's team actually beats England. And not only in the song, but in fact it is, or, or the Australians. That's why I'm actually a huge soccer, you know, basically attain a form of dominance that makes this ridiculous. So the guy in Ohio, when I come and give a lecture, does not go crazy about the fact that I use a word that to him is a priori illegitimate and actually something that he hates because it's not authentic. So it takes time. And so, and by the way, this is also very much in the men's game. I've never encountered this uh, nomenclature or, or war about a word with the, with the women's game. You, no one has ever attacked me when I use the women's national team, whatever, they play soccer. They play soccer, it's fine. Yeah. But in the, the minute it's the men, or it's in, in the context of men, even in the United, I mean, I get, I read, you know, if, if you read of some of the American, Kyle Martino was a very good color commentator, very good on, uh, on, on NBC uh, for the Premier League. He basically had to be uh, had to go because he was the only non Brit color competent, and the American football soccer audience will not accept him. He is inauthentic. He's not the real deal. Okay, um, ESPN all Brits. Okay? So I always call it the burden of the English language for the game. It's a huge burden. So does that mean that? For the men's and to the extent that the women's game progresses in lockstep as a as a as a cultural thing, acceptance-wise, that the game has to sound American for America for it to permeate the mass American sports culture to which you refer. Does it have to sound it? That's a good question. I, I'm not quite sure where you what you mean by mass, because clearly the EPL, to my delight, which of course I'm a religious fanatic of, uh, has phenomenal ratings. So clearly, the English Premier League and its team are really, I would say, I mean, I'm sure many people will, dis will dis dispute this, has entered American culture. Then. I see it in my, my classes. I teach this huge sports class, sports politics and culture class. Uh, actually, apropos, started in, at Michigan when I started in 1999. And I would say of the 200 students, 190 were in men. Now, out of the 250, it's almost even. And what is also interesting is that some, the last few years, I see as a matter of course, shirts of Roma and uh, Dortmund, and never mind the English team. So, in other words, it has actually entered the American vernacular um, to whom actually this will not be important. Because if you follow Borussia Dortmund in Ann Arbor, or whatever, it doesn't matter to you whether it's soccer or football. So ultimately, the the, the internationalism of the of the game and of the will actually diminish English hegemony. Okay, so just back to your title: different paths to a shared glory. Because this is going to help frame the sorts of things you're talking about now. I think to to what glory do you refer? Different paths to a shared glory. What, what, what's the aim? Of these. The aim, well, the aim is what we see here. The aim is, it's incredible. There's this women's tournament, and I, I just got an email from an Austrian colleague of mine who just had a very serious operation, and he said, you know, the group in Austria, they're not even here, okay? Um, uh, you know, he said, uh, it, even not way beyond the Matildas, people follow this. Mm -hmm. Now, I also got an email from a colleague in Bucharest um, who said, interestingly, this has not, I didn't, because I said I'm going to the World Cup, I didn't know about this. I actually also contribute, uh, attribute this to the fact that he's a, a, a stage director. So some artists are kind of, you know, a sociologist, like my Austrian friend, is more akin to normal press concert than a, than an artist. I, <laughs> uh, just, just saying. Um, but, um, but actually, it's true. In Europe, the further east you go, the less importance. The more people smoke, the more they actually still are part of the old world. I noticed this when I was on my book tour of my memoir, which came out in Romania. Uh, it's just uh, less, you know, people smoke and uh, people don't smoke in Frankfurt anymore. 
so in, in, in what I'm saying is that this is a major thing. Yesterday, I had to leave here because Deutschland phoned had me on for the second day in a row about the Women's World Cup. They did not have me on uh, even, uh, you know, even four years ago. They didn't have me on when, I, when it was in Germany. So clearly, this is a phenomenal presence of, 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 of culture, which is, uh, which is, which is amazing and, and uh, uh, you know, incredible. I, I, yeah. Okay, so the glory to which you refer then is the improved status and presence of, of women's football yes. in our consciousness. So let's flick back to the last question. How important is the local domestic identifications of football in the culture, soccer in the culture, to achieve that global position? To your point about, well, everyone in America has really taken on the English Premier League or whatever, particular European league that reflects their family history or whatever, and we, we have the same sort of thing here. Is that going to help or hinder the local uh, identification of football in the culture? And do you need that to improve the shared glory part of your thesis? Yet? Yes, you do. And that's a very, very good question. I'm not quite sure what the answer is, whether in fact the EPL crowds out MLS. And there's some evidence that it does. In other words, if you are a Man United fan, a City or Liverpool, whatever, you are totally following them and you may not be following the Red Bulls in real life. Right? Um, because in fact, you go for the best. And this is so American also. Don't forget the American sports consumer and the big in the classic big four in the hegemonic of culture gets the best of the best. Okay, you know, the best ice hockey is played in North America, the best basketball. They know that every day they watch the best. Clearly, they also know that in men's soccer, it's not the best. So, in that, it clearly the core of the world is Western Europe, Western Southern Europe. And obviously. This is a handicap for MLS. However, it's a feedback mechanism. MLS has now gone, I use a lot of political science to analyze all this, and I use center peripheral relations and uh, for, for many things, and of course also, uh, in this case, for players. Uh, all sports have cores, all sports have semi-peripheries, and all sports have peripheries. Uh, North America is the core for the big four, no question. This is where the Dirk Nowitz, every great European player wants to play in the core. In soccer, the core is Western Europe. American players, all 11 of our team play in, you know, for Juventus, for, for the, the usual suspects. MLS used to be peripheral. Now it's actually semi-peripheral. What I mean by this is actually it's a conduit from the periphery, which produces the labor power into the into the core, and so it's a it's a give and take. You can't quite say I think MLS is crucial. Without MLS, you could not have the EPS present because it feeds it on a daily basis. I always say I'm a huge opera fan. Go well, on Friday, of course. Um, Although it's a uh, Beethoven personality, it's not an opera. It's used for. I mean, it's, I, I love it. Shame on you, Andrew. What can I do? I, it's my it's only, long. my only night. But I, I hate it. You can't go to Sydney, not go to Yale. Okay. Yeah. So, so you, 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 you know, when I see it, the University of Michigan is a phenomenal school of music, dance, and theater, and we always, we always perform an opera every year. And my wife and I go to this, and it's glorious. Is it the Staatsoper in Vienna? Heck no, of course it is, isn't. But in fact, it, it speaks to me and it, it really is so, because it's here, because it's local, because I recreate it, because it in fact is a part of a construct. So I think MLS is crucial, even though at the top for the time being, and probably for the next 10, 15 years, it cannot compete. So the you know the 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 red bulls are not or the whatever the man uh, you know the, the New York FC is not can not be the, the similar to the great Bundesliga EPL teams. But interesting, for example, I'm of two minds about all the new MNS teams have English names. They're all called football. 
you know, they should have, they should call the bumblebees or whatever were American, the, the, you know, the, 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 the heroes, the, 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 the robbers, whatever. Okay. You know, and, and I, I think there is a, and by the way, this goes back to the accent. So the, I have friends, they're divided. I have friends who think that American teams, by definition, are illegitimate by dint of their kind of odd American names, which are okay for baseball, basketball, and football, but it's not okay for the game of association football. So it's the same guy who actually in Ohio berated me after my brilliant lecture because I called it soccer throughout and not what it should be called, named mm. football. Which, which is exactly the, uh, the same situation uh, in Australia. So, so, and just as a little disclaimer here, when Andy, Andy's not virtue sign, uh, signaling when he says, I'm going to the opera house on Friday night to watch a performance of Beethoven, he's a guy who was raised on high German culture, uh, out of immigrating out of uh, Bucharest into Austria. He's the real deal, even though he's a deadhead. Um, the elder amongst us will know who the deadheads are. So he, he actually is, is quite the panoply of issues, politics, sport, high culture, low culture. He can get down and dirty with the best of us. We can all, also speak a, a, a German dialect that only the top 10% of German high class can understand. Anyway, that's just a, to frame what you're hearing here. So that's the question about the trajectory, perhaps, of the men's competition in America. Um, I need you to reflect uh, then on the position of NWSL versus what's happening in Europe, which is of keenly more interest to this gathering, because it's sort of started, it, it's a bit of a level, it, it's more of a blank sheet, really, given the slower uptake for all the reasons that have been discussed here and, and how we fertilise uh, top flight women's football. That's the question that's burning. So if it comes to a race between Western Europe and North America when the professional leagues keep going, where do you see it? How, how's it going to play out? Who's got the advantage? As I sent you the article that you published somewhere beautifully on Australian, I don't know, some website, uh, it's now at a tipping point. Uh, the American model was basically the college model, as I call it in the article, Real, our Real Madrid were the North Carolina, the University of North Carolina Tardies. 22 NCAA championships, incredible. Mia Hamm, Heather O'Reilly, I can go on and on. I mean, the great stars of the women's game were actually created in a couple of American countries. <clears throat> Almost 20% of the current players here at the tournament are American college graduates. The Canadian team was all college graduates, more than the US team. Minus one. Minus one, yes. Uh, so clearly the, this was the factory of the women's game. We are now in a new phase of industrialization to use kind of industrial sociology. And where the European model starts to kick in, pardon the point. Meaning that it's now suddenly, and I, this I do not quite understand, I really need to do a lot more research. I've talked to my German sports colleagues and they don't understand it quite well either. The last four or five years, these clubs have really gotten on board and really find it very important to enter the women's game. I'm sure it's commercial, I'm sure it's selling tea, whatever. I mean, that, that's okay. I actually really like the point about the, our colleague who talked about Nike's brilliant ads. And I also agree with Sarah. I mean, Nike is not a nice company, trust us. I mean, it's not a good thing, but she's right. Life is more complicated. Nike's ads are phenomenal and precisely because of what she delineated beautifully. Okay? Doesn't mean that Nike is, is not a company that you want to revive in many ways. Above all, was who, who in fact produces the products that lead to these ads. That's a different story. Okay, it's Bangladeshi, basically semi slaves. Okay? Uh, but it seems to me, whatever the driving force is, that the European model has now started to develop. And it seems to me that. Going forward, 
I bet more on Real Madrid, Bayern Munich, uh, 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 Manchester City, United, uh, whatever, Barcelona, than the University of North Carolina. Right? So that ultimately, it seems to me that linking up with the, the, the greatest of the men's game, with, with all its difficulties, culturally, I think the, the, the next project I would like to do is start looking at Europe at this and at, at the WNBA. What are the, the, the benefits of being attached to great NBA teams? And what are the, 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 the problems of that? And clearly, I think it's very good that the American women did not associate with MLS because MLS does not have the gravitas that, that Real Madrid and Barcelona have. So in fact, the, 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 the women's league is on its own and not attached to MLS, which is good. I just want to travel with the microphone and, and without warning, I'm just going to bring Jess into the discussion. And as I, as I slowly make my way, it's going to buy me a bit of time to make this point, that I think there's an anticipation, a hope indeed, that American exceptionalism is going to be cut off at the knees in a football sense because Europe's just going to swamp them. Um, and Europe, European women's football is just going to go bang and the Americans are going to be like bunnies in the headlights, which, which presupposes a lack of capacity of women athletes and the programs at NCAA to evolve and to respond to that. Not that necessarily the challenge is going to be a direct one. You can respond when I ask Jess, who's immersed and brought up in that culture. The question goes to you, to them, Feed. Who wins the war between... North America and Europe. Uh, uh, is this being recorded or? <laughs> Only your voice. I want to be off the record. I can put another face on. Um, it, honestly, I've had so many things I almost raised my hand to the entire time you were speaking because uh, I have been brought through the US system, which started at six years old. So that's 29 years um, since then to date myself. Uh, one thing that's really interesting is that you talked about, um, you know, this obsession sort of with the English side of things. And and anyone here who's played uh, youth soccer in the U.S. knows that anytime there's a coach with an English accent, yes. everyone thinks they know what they're talking yeah. about. Yes. Yeah. And I've yeah. experienced plenty who absolutely don't. Um, so it's really interesting you, you draw that parallel because we still see it now. A coach has any sort of accent, actually, and, and suddenly they're the expert, which isn't necessarily the case. Um, I think what the U.S. does, and I'm just going to speak about the women's side of things, is we have a huge talent factory. We could enter five teams in the World Cup and still have them be in the upper 50% of the tournament. And I, I really and truly believe that because we just have such a depth of really solid players. And a lot of that does come from mentality and it comes from athleticism. The speed of the game is something I think not a lot of Europeans could enter into. You could take some of the best European players and put them into the NWSL and you might see them struggle a bit because the game is highly transitional, physical, athletic, fast, as opposed to in most of Europe, which is more technical, tactical. Same as you can take some of the best United States players and put them in leagues in Europe and they might struggle to get minutes at the Manchester cities or even at um, in Sweden in Rosenborg or uh, Biko Hacken or something like that. Ultimately, I think the model in Europe is stronger. Um, I like the academy system because it's mostly based around local talent, um, home-based players who stick through the entirety of the system. And then when they get to a senior team, they are already immersed in the style of play. In the NWSL, the contracts are not as stable, meaning you can get traded on, in, you know, in any moment you lose your contract. Obviously, the CBA is changing things, but uh, there's not as much stability. You could be a player raised in Washington, D.C., and when you graduate from school, you'll be signed to uh, Portland Thorns, and there's no, um, you don't have that culture in the community that you were raised in, which I think is something Europe does better. Um, in terms of development of players, in my opinion, there's no doubt that Europe does it better. Um, but I think that... Americans do have a little bit stronger of a mentality. So I think the perfect player has experienced both. I think it's it's difficult for you to be completely well-rounded without experiencing both. Um, and, and there are many of the best players in the world, as we've seen Pernella Harder's played in the U.S., Sam Kerr's played in the U.S. Those are just two who are relevant right now. But 
so many strong European and, and also players coming from Australia and other places have played in the U.S. and that's created a more well-rounded player. So I do think ultimately the U.S. is going to have to change their model. I think the NCAA is going to become weaker. I think we're going to start seeing more and more young players hop into NWSL or hop into European academy leagues, at least the top players. Um, your average American high school graduate who is pretty decent might still continue to play in the NCAA, but I think we'll see more of a, a mass exodus in the next coming years unless the U.S. changes this strategy. I agree. Uh, and if someone else would like to ask a question of Andy, we can do that. I wonder, Andy, just for you to mull on this whilst I travel, on the delineation of salary, player salary makes to this. So if the huge incremental value of licenses in the NWSL translates into high salaries, does that keep top American players in the NWSL or do they go to Europe for altruistic, technical, cultural reasons to him. Is it a money thing, ultimately? Do you want to model on that whilst I get no. five and ready? I, I, go ahead, please. Uh, Andre, we're in Australia. We fully relate where you're coming from about in the US, you have to call soccer. When I was going out, um, you know, yeah, it was interesting to us soccer. But one, one year I won a book of wood. Association football, and I said to my mates, Why are we calling this game soccer when it's actually spoken before football? But the reason we, when we say we're playing football, the other codes would say, No, you don't have a right to um, say you're playing football, but that belongs to us. So that was like rugby league, Aussie rules, um, rugby union, they distinct themselves. But so we've had to fight hard to get to this present moment. Um, and right to be able to start calling this sport football. But if, if I would say to someone, I'm playing football, then, you know, you would have to argue that, to say which code of football you're playing. That's why, um, um, you know, we, we, we had to call it soccer. Yeah. yeah. Now, my question to you is, in the US, I wouldn't lose hope. Look at David Beckham investing in they're getting messy over. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. was a very successful coup. Um, um, I see a future in the US. Maybe it's just not for real. How are you going to structure it? Um, you know, it will always be relevant. Yes, I have a bit concerned. You know, it used to be the number one country for the women's football. Maybe it's got to be backwards. But that can be fixed. Yeah, I see that. Yeah. Uh, can, I, can I just say something? Yeah. Uh, look, uh, but only in the English language is the, at least that I researched, is that this fascinating, nuanced, constant fight about identity that you just delineated beautifully, do we play? So I actually sometimes want to just call it X. I mean, I don't care what it's called. It doesn't matter what it's called. But to millions of people, it does. No, you cannot. Because it's all about, it's all about, uh, it's all about, you know, in a Bourdieu sense, it's all about difference. And of course, it's not only about difference, but about qualitative difference. Implied is what we play, our football is superior to yours. It's a form of differentiation that is always qualitative. And in fact, in all these countries where soccer is secondary, the word football denotes the dominant code. American football, Canadian football, yeah. Um, fascinating. Uh, ben Messi, brilliant. Un when I was in Romania, what I read, on the, if someone actually, people said, Messi is coming to the US. I said, oh my God, this is number three. There have been three impetuses into American soccer. Number one, 1970s Pele. Pele is crucial, although very much declining, but Pele and Beckenbauer, but above all Pele. Uh, he is single-handedly important for the failing NASL, which had everybody playing the cry for Nascans and everything, but really on the way out. However, it was crucial because it entered in the 70s and 80s, they, dis they disappeared in 1985, because it created into the excerpts of a white middle class to whom soccer became a million, million, 
basically also interested in anti-football. It was very much a middle-class white sport delineated against the working class, beer drinking, et cetera, et cetera, the real football, okay? Uh, and that's Pelé and the NASL, together with the women. So Title IX, Pelé really propel soccer on our grassroots in America. Number two, David Beckham. The MLS, MLS was about to go under. Uh, it was in dire shape. And in comes Beckham. And I, again, was rejoicing because he's not the best player in the world, but he fit the mold. English speaker, uh, very much a completely a, a superstar, but not only in soccer, but in culture. You know, you drive on the LA freeway, there is David Beckham in some underwear shirt or under pants or whatever, okay? But nothing to do with soccer. And he's, of course, English speaker, which at the time was very important. He comes to LA and he wins, crucial, saves MLS. And now Lionel Messi, and I know that we there is a God in the world when that goal happened, you know, with the 91st minute. Uh, there's nothing, you can't, it's unbelievable. And clearly he is, but he is crucial at a time that soccer has really grown in America, that people know about the World Cup, that it's actually what used to be called water cooler time. There's no more water coolers because everybody's working on Zoom and we don't go to the office anymore. But water cooler talk where people thought that Messi is that. So in fact, I am immensely optimistic uh, that I'm not sure in my lifetime, but here's the, here's the, the key for soccer in America to become a real number five and a constant parlance in sports radio. I analyze sports radio, still virtually no soccer. Okay, like, you know, it's not enough or, you know, what happened? Um, although one of my students actually said, Professor Markovitz, again, back to, uh, to, to what we talked about earlier, uh, Professor Markovitz, I hate to break this to you, but sports radio is important to you guys. Okay, to me, it's all about Twitter. Or, and clearly, uh, the Twitter feed of Messi and of Ronaldo, whatever, is huge, much higher than of American football players. Interesting research. I have a student doing this, an undergraduate project. Why is it uh, global soccer players and the NBA stars that are by far the most prominent in the social media? Very interesting. Okay, so And they're all friends. So Messi is very close to Steph Curry. You know? And LeBron James flies to Miami or whatever, Fort Lauderdale to see the game because he welcomes Messi. So there's a very interesting thing. That, but I think the key thing is for the US men to gain at least a position in the, in the semifinals in a game in the World Cup, lose gloriously to Argentina or Brazil or Germany or to England, I mean, obviously, to win the World Cup, but that's not going to happen in my life. But the, my, my scenario that I would like for it to happen, I think, is realistic for ultimately for it to become. And lastly, the United States is diverse enough, rich enough, and, and yeah, and, 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 and 340 million people to actually carry five sports as a hegemonic culture. In other words, so the, the, the 12-year-old kid in Southern California uh, who now is playing four sports okay, uh, may in fact now choose soccer. When I wrote Offside, I interviewed a wonderful cornerback for the New England Patriots, brilliant player. And he was a superstar in Southern California in soccer. Clearly, rational choice, he opted for football. Obviously, okay, he wanted it for his family. You, you didn't, because it was a very clear path and he made, he, he, he did well. I think that this will, this is changing and that the very best athletes, because some people also argue that our greatest athletes are playing shortstop for the New York Yankees, point guard for the LA Lakers, and that they're not the best the athletic talented men don't go into soccer. Okay? This is changing. 
precisely because also Europe has become closer. So you can now Pulisic, even though you know I'm not, I don't like Chelsea, but I was always rooting for Pulisic to really pull it off. He unfortunately didn't, which really bothered me because it would have been a very important lead. For, he now goes to Juventus. Uh, he's played for Milan. I love Milan. The IBC, I really know the the the, 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 the Rossoneri. It's great, but I'm a little upset because Milan is not Chelsea. Milan is not English speaker. Milan, of course, has a presence in the United States, but a smaller one than the, again, the language thing is crucial. English is the language, which is the language of difference, of language of this fight about this nonsense thing about names, but ultimately the EPL is closer to your American consumer than Milan. So we need American superstars to, to excel in the EPL and not keepers, because we've had very good keepers, but keepers don't count. Americans are very good keepers because they've all American sports are played by hand. <laughs> but you need a, 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 a number nine, number nine who, who, you know, who, who really would, would, would do this and it'll happen. Again, very similar. Um, we got back to the nomenclature issue. I'm going to leave this one hanging as we thank Andy Markovitz for his time. I'll have a big breather. Um, but I just wonder, and I'll leave this with you, talking about nomenclature. Is there an issue in delineating men's soccer and women's soccer? We're calling it women's football and men's football. Are we creating something else here later by the clear identification, or is it just one game? We'll leave it with you on that point, and we'll be back in just a few minutes. So stretch your legs. And a thanks to Andy Markovitz. You know the books. Thank you. You're very welcome.